I've been asked to talk today about the role of diagnostic laparoscopy in unexplained acute and chronic abdominal pain. As surgeons, we tend to see patients with two uh, distinct abdominal pain entities. We see patients acutely in the hospital, in the emergency room, on the wards, or in the intensive care unit, and we see people with chronic pain who we typically see in the office. They often have been seen by multiple other physicians. Uh, they've been completely worked up. They've often had previous surgery. And the pain is often ascribed by other physicians to uh, the presence of adhesions. The initial approach that we have to patients in the acute setting I'll uh, focus on first. And basically, in those patients, it's imperative to ha have a thorough history and physical examination, including a history of previous laparotomy scars, abdominal distension, and the presence of hernias. And the past medical history is also very important, as well as the hemodynamic status, the presence of shock or sepsis, are very important uh, items. Appropriate blood work and uh, investigations are imperative. And in fact, these patients should be uh, worked up sufficiently such that they can be taken to the operating room. Most of these patients will have diagnostic views of the abdomen, a CAT scan, and abdominal ultrasound. At this point, however, all that is known is that there's an acute intra-abdominal process that is as yet undetermined, and operative exploration, with or without operative therapeutic intervention, is essential. Now, there are relative contraindications to laparoscopy. Hypotension is one of them. If a patient is uh, markedly hypotensive, the actual uh, creation of pneumoperitoneum may worsen that situation, and uh, therefore, uh, uh, hypotension is a relative contraindication to laparoscopy. Multiple previous operations, the so-called hostile abdomen, may make laparoscopy difficult to perform. If it's difficult to perform, it may take a long amount of time to actually provide exposure, and in that situation, it's relatively contraindicated. Massive distension from bowel obstruction is a potential problem that may make access or maneuverability within the abdominal cavity uh, quite difficult and therefore is a relative contraindication, although we've treated many patients with bowel obstruction. Marked obesity can be a problem. Uh, the third trimester of pregnancy is a contraindication. And increased intracranial pressure, which you may see in some patients in the ICU, particularly the trauma patient, is a contraindication. Now, before the operating room, it's imperative to stabilize the patient. And for us as surgeons, that's pretty straightforward. Generally speaking, it means IV hydration. We correct electrolytes. The bladders catheterize. The bowel should be decompressed, if possible, preoperatively. What's very important in this uh, situation is the consent. The risks and benefits of both the open and laparoscopic approaches uh, should be obtained. Remember, these patients may be converted. A laparoscopic attempt is not a commitment uh, to perform laparoscopy, and it may just be an aid in diagnosis. And the patient must be prepared for conversion, uh, possible bowel resection, or ostomy creation. There are certain uh, prerequisites to proceed with laparoscopy. The first is it's imperative to understand what the goal of laparoscopy will be. It's to provide an accurate diagnosis, and then if one uh, continues uh, with laparoscopy, to provide standard therapy for intra-abdominal conditions. Adequate instrumentation is very important. Uh, typically, I use a 30-degree 10-millimeter uh, camera. You get better visualization with that, and that's what I uh, prefer. All other instrumentation, including suction irrigation, is important. The surgeon must have a sufficient skill set. Now, for diagnosis only, the surgeon must be comfortable to explore all relevant surgical spaces, and the surgeon must be able to run the bowel. If one wants to indulge in therapeutic maneuvers laparoscopically, then the surgeon must be able to resect an anastomose laparoscopically, and the surgeon must be able to suture and tie intracorporeally. Now, when I perform these operations, we typically prefer an open Hassan technique at the umbilicus. Uh, rarely, particularly if the umbilicus or the midline is full of scar tissue, um, we will do a varus needle insertion away from the uh, midline to avoid major vascular structures and in virgin territory, and then the first trocar will go in at that site. We always use a 30 degree and occasionally a 45 degree laparoscope. The most important first step when you place a laparoscope in the abdomen is to get a panoramic view of the uh, abdominal contents, looking for the telltale signs of a disturbance as a clue. And typically what you'll find is purulence, 
or acute fibrinous adhesions or phlegminous change in the area where the uh, inflammatory process has originated. Occasionally there's pooling of intestinal content or blood in that location, although sometimes it's throughout the abdominal cavity and it renders no clue as to where the process is. And uh, one looks for distension, and particularly distension and then downstream non-distended bowel if one's looking for a site of uh, bowel obstruction. That panoramic view is a clue as to the port positioning and the, the reason for the ports at this point, and it's typically two five millimeter ports, is to explore, uncover, unravel to find out where that process is so that that can be ascertained and then therapy can be delivered uh, as necessary. Those findings will determine subsequent maneuvers, uh, additional ports, conversion, hand assistance, etc., uh, for uh, therapy. After adequate visualization, we then place uh, additional ports, which can be upsized. We start with five millimeter ports. Thereafter, we adhere to a, a very important principle of triangulation of the two working ports in order to make the diagnosis. Therefore, the placement of those ports is, is very important. Uh, subsequent decision making for optimal positioning, uh, trocar size and so on, will be made after the process is uncovered. Or one may make the decision to convert at that point. Now I'd like to run through a couple of scenarios uh, to demonstrate where I would place ports and the rationale for placing the port in that location. If the patient has, after the p first panoramic view of the abdomen, if the patient has evidence of a process in the right upper quadrant, then we want to triangulate so our hands work uh, uh, efficiently. We want to triangulate in the right upper quadrant. And therefore, I will place a, typically two ports in either this position along the pararectal line in the left upper quadrant and the pararectal line in the right mid-abdomen to allow for tri triangulation. Or I will place the uh, port in the epigastrium in this location. So once again, triangulation is carried out. I typically place ports either along the linea alba or along the pararectal lines on the right or left side. And the reason for that is if you place the port through the uh, rectus abdominis, you have a much higher chance of bleeding complications. Uh, similarly, we adopt the, the exact same approach for the uh, left upper quadrant, epigastric and left mid-abdomen or uh, right abdomen and left abdomen. And we do exactly the same thing for the right lower quadrant and the left lower quadrant. Now, this would be my typical position for ports for a right lower quadrant process. So today, when I do a laparoscopic appendectomy, I place a telescope at the umbilicus, two five millimeter ports in a pararectal location, and that offers excellent triangulation in the right lower quadrant for efficient appendectomy. Uh, this is an alternative uh, position pl uh, port position placement for the right lower quadrant. And the left lower quadrant is an exact mirror image of the right side. The patient can be placed in Trendelenburg a position for lower abdominal pathology, reverse Trendelenburg for upper abdominal pathology, and uh, we certainly can tilt the patient with the affected side up uh, when necessary. There are a number of studies that uh, have uh, tried to evaluate the role of laparoscopy in the management of non-traumatic acute abdomen. And this is a fairly early study which was published in 1995 uh, out of Belgium of 255 patients which were evaluated for acute abdomen. And what's important in this paper is that they demonstrated a 93% diagnostic accuracy rate in that particular series. They converted a number of those patients to open surgery in order to complete the operation. But most importantly, 73% of the patients in this early series were treated completely laparoscopically with 4% treated with a laparoscopic assisted technique. Another paper, and I think this is one of the best papers published to date, was in surgical endoscopy in 2003. And this was 277 consecutive emergencies. What's important is that at this point in time, which is later in the history of laparoscopy in general surgery, laparoscopy obtained a correct diagnosis in 98.6% of cases. 75% of those cases were completed laparoscopically. 12.5 of them required an incision, but the incision was targeted based on the findings at laparoscopy. 12.5% underwent formal laparotomy. And what's significant is that there was no laparoscopy-related mortality in this series.
Now, there are a number of pathologies we can encounter in the acute abdomen, and those include inflammatory conditions, ischemic conditions, perforation or obstruction. And I, I'll run through them briefly. Obviously, for many of these patients, acute cholecystitis will be found at the time of surgery, or other conditions that are uh, not uncommon in surgery, Meckel's diverticulitis, appendicitis, diverticulitis, or Crohn's disease. Other conditions include ischemic bowel, infarcted omentum, torsion of an appendices epiploque, and incarcerated hernia, which might not be evident on physical examination, particularly in the obese patient. Uh, clearly, perforation uh, occurs, perforated duodenal ulcers, gastric ulcers, iatrogenic bowel perforation, and we're seeing more of this, where we're actually treating patients post-colonoscopic perforation with primary repair done laparoscopically and usually discharged within a day or two of that event. Perforated cholecystitis, appendicitis, or diverticulitis. Bowel obstruction is something we're treating uh, uh, fairly aggressively laparoscopically. Uh, often you find a single adhesive band uh, which can be uh, lysed uh, very rapidly and those patients are typically ready for discharge the next day. Incarcerated internal or external hernias uh, can occur, chronic stricture, neoplasm. Uh, bedside laparoscopy is something that we've done in septic patients in uh, the uh, intensive care unit. And these are typically patients that are so unstable that it's difficult to move them to the CAT scan or even move them to the operating room because of the instability. And in those patients uh, who are septic uh, and who have sepsis of unknown origin, we have found that there is some utility to bedside laparoscopy. We found in our series that bedside laparoscopy is very accurate. Our series is, uh, was reported by John Kelly in Surgical Endoscopy in 2000. And over about one year at that time, we collected 17 patients. And we were able to successfully complete bedside laparoscopy in 16 of the 17. What's important is that it was very accurate in the diagnosis of ischemic bowel, acute cholecystitis, or appendicitis. And we felt it could uh, be done at, right at the bedside to expedite the diagnosis eliminate the burden for transfer of those patients, and save on anesthesia and operating room charges. And that has been shown by a number of other authors in the literature with fundamentally the same message. To illustrate what you can see at the bedside, this is an actual bedside laparoscopy, which demonstrates visualization of the gallbladder to rule out acute cholecystitis. We look at the small bowel transverse colon to look at uh, whether or not there's mesenteric ischemia, and we look at the appendix. We get a good overview of the abdomen, and this allows us to determine whether or not this patient needs to go to the operating room or not. A very interesting paper that was recently published on the laparoscopic management of surgical complications after recent laparotomy. Uh, Fourteen patients over a, a four-year period were collected that had had previous uh, recent laparotomy extending from three to 15 days. And the incisions are as follows. And the indications for surgery, you can see small bowel obstruction, anastomotic complications, intra-abdominal collections, or perforation and retained uh, laparotomy pad. What they found is that not only could they complete laparoscopy in, the, in a patient uh, following surgery or immediately following surgery, but uh, they could also treat the condition effectively in the vast majority of cases. Now I'd like to show a number of video clips that illustrate what I've been talking about with respect to the diagnosis of acute abdominal conditions. This is an example of a perforated gastric ulcer. You can see we have an overview. We were suspicious of that because there was a lot of free air in the abdomen. You can see there's a lot of soilage. And uh, there's so much gross soilage, there's no telltale sign in one location that, that leads us to the right pathology, but the history was our, our greatest clue. And here we're obviously reflecting the liver upward, breaking down bluntly the fibrinous uh, adherence between the liver and stomach. You can see the principle though, triangulation of the ports in the upper abdomen, the telescope with good visualization, 30 degree telescope. And you can see the perforation right there, gastric ulcer perf, that we subsequently treat completely laparoscopically. Now this is another example of a patient that uh, once again we thought from history this condition was probably a perforated peptic ulcer. We saw previously a perforated gastric ulcer and here we're exploring underneath the uh, liver once again breaking down these adhesions with blunt dissection to uncover the pathology. You see the same principles triangulation with good visualization.
And as we break down these adhesions gently, you will uh, eventually see the, uh, the ulcer, which once again, one has the option of treating either laparoscopically or uh, converting to open surgery. In this particular case, we treated this laparoscopically. And there's the perforation. You see that the sucker has gone actually in the duodenum in the perforation. Uh, this is an example of uh, a gangrenous gallbladder. And typically, however, we, we will have a high index of suspicion as to this pathology. But once again, illustrating the principles, you can see that the inflammatory process is uh, confined to the uh, right upper quadrant. And for this reason, our port selection and port positioning is as I depicted earlier. Triangulation, good visualization, blunt dissection in the uh, area where we have the highest index of suspicion, and lo and behold, there's a gangrenous gallbladder, which we uh, uncover uh, for diagnosis and then, in this case, subsequent treatment. In many instances, a hernia can be found. This is a case of a bowel obstruction where, in fact, a Richter's hernia was discovered. Because this patient was obese, I must say we, we were not certain that uh, a hernia was present in the uh, femoral space, but here you can see a very small knuckle of bowel has actually been incarcerated and partially strangulated. This case was treated with uh, high ligation of the sac and uh, laparoscopic bowel resection. In this particular clip, uh, this is a patient that uh, presented with obstructive symptomatology of unknown etiology, although this patient had had a previous uh, Rouen-Y gastrojejunostomy for morbid obesity. What we found was a uh, loop of uh, bowel trapped underneath the uh, enteroenterostomy uh, through the uh, mesenteric window. And you can see that laparoscopy was effective in evaluating this condition, reducing the uh, internal herniated bowel, and then we ended up uh, laparoscopically closing the mesenteric defect. This is another example of a case of a bowel obstruction and uh, exploration is being carried out laparoscopically and I think it's imperative to, to understand how to run the small bowel when one uh, is uh, treating patients for bowel obstruction. But uh, in any case, you can see some dilated loops of bowel and uh, we're actually, uh, once again, adhering to the principle of uh, uh, triangulation in terms of this exploration. And as we search around, we find an adhesion band under which the bowel has herniated and uh, created the obstruction. This band is elevated and then it's, uh, it's sharply uh, divided. And uh, this patient did extremely well postoperatively. There is a second band that was found and this too was divided. Now we run the entire small bowel to make sure that it's uh, free and it was. We've uh, used this technique in the pediatric age group as well. This is an example of a young girl who came to me with acute abdominal pain of unknown etiology and uh, she had peritoneal signs and we found a foreign body in her small bowel that had clearly penetrated. It turned out to be a, a toothpick which we extracted. The small bowel was subsequently sutured. This is another example of a patient who had uh, uh, clear-cut peritonitis. Once again we placed a visualization port with at least uh, in this case two accessory ports to try and uncover the pathology. And uh, our attention was directed fairly early on to the left lower quadrant. And after mobilization of the sigmoid, we saw a clear-cut perforation. This is an example of how I believe we should uh, run the small bowel.
there's uh, the ligament of trites. And you see how the, the operating surgeon has crossed his hands. I think with experience, that's acceptable. But for the inexperienced operating surgeon, I think it's best to hand the bowel from one instrument to another. In that way, there's no uh, torsion on the bowel and there's uh, less chance of tearing the cirrhosis of the bowel. It is imperative to use atraumatic instruments to minimize the uh, risk of injury to the bowel. Now what this surgeon is doing is uh, allowing his left hand to drift outside of the field of view and I think insofar as you can keep the entire small bowel in the field of view while you run it, I think that's advisable because an, uh, a tear can uh, go unrecognized if these instruments uh, go outside the field of view. But this uh, handoff technique, I think, is the safest way uh, of uh, running the bowel. Now I'd like to um, uh, change directions and talk about our approach to uh, chronic abdominal pain. Now typically we see these patients in the clinic. These patients have oftentimes seen several physicians to help elucidate the source of pain. Basically, all non-invasive uh, diagnostic studies have usually been performed at this point. CT scan, ultrasound, upper and lower endoscopy, and barium studies, usually upper and lower. Our goal is to take a thorough history and physical examination. Patient selection is really the key uh, in these patients. Patients who have wandering pain, uh, it seems to be in one location on one visit and perhaps another location on another visit, are very poorly localized pain syndromes are much less likely to benefit from laparoscopy. Other clues as to whether or not uh, laparoscopy is indicated or whether or not there's another etiology for the pain might be pain with meals, which suggests a, a GI disturbance. Uh, pain with movement and position, defecation or intercourse may suggest that there's an adhesion-related uh, phenomenon uh, going on. The consent process is of paramount importance in these patients. Patients must be aware that there are risks of laparoscopy. Many times when patients are sent to me, they have this idea that we're going to make a small incision and uh, a laparoscopy is a, is a, a same-day surgery with uh, very little inherent risk. But the reality is, and particularly in these patients who often have been labeled as having adhe adhesive disease and who often have been explored at, at some point in the past for adhesions, will be uh, very difficult laparoscopies to undertake. And the risks of laparoscopy can be very real and devastating. Uh, realistic expectations with respect to success must be conveyed to the patient. The patient must understand that this pain might not improve. And in fact, uh, the pain often does not improve in these patients. The placebo effect benefit may wear off, um, particularly when there's no obvious pathology found. And what I mean by that is you perform a laparoscopy, on the first postoperative visit, the patient has a placebo effect and says, yes, I think I'm better, but then by the next visit, the pain has recurred. And the beneficial effect uh, may even be transient for those people with pathology. You find adhesions, you lyse the adhesion, presumably the patient improves on that basis, but then the pain recurs because the adhesion or adhesive disease recurs in those patients. Uh, it's very important to take a good history in these patients. Uh, and the findings at the time of surgery need to be congruent with the patient's complaint because one can actually uh, place a laparoscope and find unrelated findings in the abdomen which have absolutely no um, relationship to the patient's history. So one must be very versed with what the patient's complaints are and that congruence must be found. Preoperative targeting and marking of the pain site or the trigger point so as to direct therapy when you're in the abdomen is absolutely essential. And I tend to see those patients in the holding area prior to sedation. I place an X on their abdomen so I know exactly where their pain complaint is so that there's no confusion in the operating room as to whether or not what I find may or may not be related to the pain syndrome. And once again, we start with a 30-degree telescope at the umbilicus because we want that panoramic view of the abdomen to get started. And what we're looking for are signs or clues, adhesions, hernia, chronic inflammation, and so on. Well, I tend to do a meticulous exploration of the entire abdomen. And what that means is I start either from the top and work my, made my way down, or I start from the bottom and work my, my way up. And by that I mean, uh, once I place a laparoscope in, I look at the liver, I look at all surfaces of the stomach, typically, the anterior for sure. Uh, in patients who have lower abdominal complaints, I actually do not open the lesser sac and look at the posterior wall or look at the pancreas. 
Uh, those patients have typically been imaged with the CT scan, which will actually show me the pancreas better than I can see at laparoscopy. I look at the duodenum, I look at the small bowel, and I, I run the entire small bowel from top to bottom and evaluate for the presence of a Meckel's diverticulum. I look at the colon and I look at the appendix, ascending colon. I elevate the uh, omentum so I'm able to look at the transverse colon. One can actually look at the uh, uh, descending sigmoid and upper rectum. And then in women, I look at the uterus, fallopian tubes, and ovaries. And what I'm looking for is congruence. The patient has a complaint. I've marked the site. And I want correlation between what I find and those complaints that the patient had. Potential pathologies we can uh, uh, find abound. Uh, chronic appendicitis, adhesions, Crohn's disease, endometriosis, chronic cholecystitis uh, would probably be the top five findings. And then we could find a host of other things which are other conditions which are well known to surgeons. Now what's the utility of this maneuver of uh, laparoscopy and chronic abdominal pain? Well in one study, which was published quite recently in surgery, 70 patients were evaluated, usually women, and the average length of time these uh, patients had pain was 74 weeks. So uh, greater than one year and they'd been through a gamut of investigations. And the entrance criteria for this study was unexplained pain for at least 12 weeks. Patients with signs of obstruction were excluded from the review. Well, what did they find? Well, there were no conversions to open. They found adhesions in the vast majority of patients, hernias, which were unappreciated, appendiceal adhesions or appendiceal pathology suggesting a chronic appendicitis, three with endometriosis, two with gallbladder problems that were not appreciated, and 10 with no pathology. What was important was 90% had relief at the initial visit, 71% uh, had relief long term, which means greater than six months, and there was no recurrence of pain beyond six months, which means if patients were to have recurrence, they all recurred within the first six months, and they followed these patients for about, on average, two and a half years. Well, let's look at another study, uh, also published in Surgical Endoscopy, um, with respect to the uh, feasibility of laparoscopic adhesiolysis in patients with chronic abdominal pain. And this was a retrospective review of 157 patients undergoing adhesiolysis over a long period of time. And remember, this is early on in the, in the period of uh, laparoscopy for general surgeons. The entrance criteria uh, were continuous or intermittent abdominal pain for at least one month, which is a short period of time in terms of the evaluation of patients with chronic abdominal pain. And I personally would be very reluctant to explore somebody with that label um, at one month. The exclusion criteria were patients with an identifiable process which could ex explain the pain or an acute or an inflammatory process. Well, seven patients in this series were converted. Sixteen had major complications, the most significant of which were 11 visceral perforations and there were two deaths. 80% uh, of, of patients had relief after short-term follow-up of six weeks. But what I think this uh, study underscores is that there, is, there can be a very high complication rate for this subgroup of patients. And you might ask the question, why? Well, firstly, in this particular series, remember the patients uh, uh, were uh, collected from as early as 1991 when perhaps surgeons were not as experienced as they are today with laparoscopy. But more importantly, these patients frequently have had multiple operations, have, had multiple, uh, have multiple abdominal scars, have a lot of adhesions in the abdomen, which might be dense. And in the lysis of these adhesions, you might actually inadvertently injure the bowel from electrocautery, decerosalize the bowel, which may subsequently perforate later, and so on. So these complications can be very real and very devastating. And one can, can never forget that when one is recommending uh, laparoscopy for a patient that has been completely investigated and has no obvious signs uh, for pain. So in conclusion, laparoscopy provides an opportunity to diagnose and treat many acute intra-abdominal conditions. Most likely, there's a benefit to smaller incisions for diagnosis and for the treatment of most conditions. However, and this is very important, any benefits of minimally invasive approaches must be mitigated by the potential for treatment delays and therefore prolonged setup times for laparoscopy and uh, for laparoscopic exposure uh, and treatment should be minimized. When they cannot be minimized, this may contraindicate the laparoscopic approach and these patients should be done open or converted.
Uh, my conclusions for abdominal pain, which is chronic in nature. Laparoscopy provides an opportunity to diagnose and treat some chronic intra-abdominal conditions. Many chronic conditions are better diagnosed less invasively by radiologic imaging or endoluminal visualization techniques. Therefore, and this is very important, these modalities should be carried out first, be of high quality, and be obtained within a fairly narrow window, uh, about six months. If investigations are older than six months, I repeat them. And finally, surgery should only be performed in highly selected patients for this condition.